Since we've learned two kinds of probabilities, it's important to take a moment here to compare those two probabilities, namely the classical and the empirical probability, and think about how those differences show up and why they matter to us. So let's imagine a probability experiment where we are going to toss a coin and then a six-sided die. So if that's the case, then how large is the sample space? Well, that's not too bad to figure. It's 2 times 6, which is 12, because you have two options for the coin and six options for the die. That makes 12. Now we want to construct a sample space using a tree diagram. Um, and often when you're doing sample, or excuse me, when you're doing tree diagrams to create your sample space, you will simplify your life. So you don't want to write heads and tails all the time. So write H and T. So take a moment and try to do that. And there it is, more or less. Let me make all this part go away, but the rest of it's there. All right, so you can see the green is my first event. So I have the option of a head or a tail. And then once I have the head, I have six branches that can come off from that. One, two, three, four, five, six, because the die could roll one, two, three, four, five, or six. That gives me my sample space outcomes of H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, H6, and so on. And then I have T1, T2, and so on through T6. So there is my sample space listing over here on the right. And this tree diagram helped me build it. Lovely. So now, oops, I don't know why that black part occurred. Hold on one second. There, don't know why that was there. So now what is the probability of tossing H1? Heads and then a 1. Well, that's up here. And there's one outcome out of 12. So that would mean the probability is 1 out of 12, which is 0 0.083. Repeating. Beautiful. All right, then. Now we need to actually do the experiment. So I'll do it myself. So I have a coin here on my table. And I'm going to toss it. And then I'm going to grab a die and roll it. And I am actually going to grab an online die. Here, this is the indeed dice roller. I'm going to click roll, and I got a 3. So I rolled a 3, so I got H3 right here. I'm going to highlight that one. All right, so there's my outcome. You circle whichever one you get when you roll it yourself, if you so desire. I'm going to make it gray so you guys can see it better. All right, so now how many trials of the experiment were in a class? So if, if we pretend that we had a class of people doing this, just pretend. So everybody in the room rolls this. Then let's say that there were 30 people in the room. Let's see. And let's pretend that just say three of them roll it, or toss it, I should say. All right, that could happen. So you have 30 students or 29 students and one me in a room and 30 people toss, but only three of them get H1, which is this first one right here. All right, so if that's the case, then what's the probability, the empirical probability of tossing H1 that was found in our class? Well, that would be 3 out of 10, excuse me, 3 out of 30, which is 1 out of 10, which is 0 0.1. Either one of these would work. All right, now what? Explain the difference between the classical and the empirical probabilities. Got it. So we said in the previous page that it was 1 out of 12, 0 0.083. But when we actually do it, we got 1 out of 10, 0 0.1. And I actually have done this with many classes. So what's the difference? Well, the classical is kind of like your hypothetical. It's 1 out of 12, 0 0.083. You assume that all 12 of the outcomes are equally likely. The empirical is from the actual data. So um, in this case, I made it up with a computer, but you get the general idea, right? It came from actual data, right? And if that's the case, then that experiment was conducted and you recorded the outcomes and you created the probability from there. And the probability is deduced um, from the results. So they're not the same thing. They should be close to each other though, right? I mean, hypothetically speaking. So note the classical and empirical probabilities should be close to each other. 
Now, how close? Well, it kind of depends on how many times you do it. Right? If you do 30 times, not that close. But if you do 300, much closer, which gets us to the next part. So I'm going to repeat this. So you do it again. This time I got tails. Then I'm going to go toss a die. Oops, I got a three again. So I got T3 right here. You do it yourself and record what you get, whatever. Now, how many times did we do this? Well, we did 30 again. Pretend we're still in that room full of 30 people. And then how many of them get it this time? Let's pretend four of them got it. Okay. Well, then what's the empirical rule of tossing H1 for this round of the experiment? Well, that would be four out of 30. Oops. 4 out of 30, which would be 0 0.13 repeating, the little repeating bar on its head. Oh, and if you wanted to reduce fraction just for the sake of it, 2 goes into 4 2 times, 2 goes into um, 30 15 times. So, not that I asked for a reduced fraction, but if you wanted one, there you've got it. All right, so you notice that this time our class got a different probability. So that means that empirical probabilities change. Time after time, you'll get different probabilities coming from them. So they're not going to be the same, nor would we really expect them to be, right? So that means that every time you do an experiment, it's going to be slightly different from each other. Oopsie. My probability in F was this. The probability, I actually don't know if those were the right letters. Probability in F, yep, probability in J. So they're not the same, nor would we expect them to be necessarily. They should be close to each other, right? Um, they will be slightly different, but close. Oops, and that's what I just wrote there. It's like I planned it. So they should be relatively close to each other, but they will not be exactly the same. And they should always be close to the classical probability of 0 0.083. And both of these numbers are relatively close to 0 0.083. Not identical to it, but close. All right, so then how do those compare in the long run? So if you kept going, if you tossed and tossed and tossed again and again and again, what would happen? So let's imagine our two trials together in one. So we did 60 trials total. Can I have this backwards? 60 trials total, and we had seven of them tossed H1. That gives us a total fraction and decimal of 7 over 60, which would be 0 0.116 repeating. That. All right. Then if the class repeated this trial or this experiment over and over and over and kept going, we didn't do it one time of 30 and another time of 30, but we did one time of 30 and another and then another and then another and so on and so on and so on. And you kept tallying your results. What would you expect to have happen with this empirical probability? Well, I would expect it to get closer and closer to what we actually really expect it to be, which is 0 0.083, which is the classical probability. So with the overall total probability, which is empirical, right? Empirical we we'll get closer and closer to the classical probability value of zero or of one out of twelve, which would be zero point zero eight three repeating. Okay. Now, this leads us to the law of large numbers. What that's saying is that if you repeat a probability experiment over and over and over and over, if you play this hand of cards over and over, if you roll this die over and over, if you toss this coin over and over, but in the long run, your proportion of times that your given event occurs, i.e. the empirical probability, will approach its classical probability. That's what classical probability is. It's that hypothetical probability that we know is there as the foundation. And then the empirical probability is what we actually see in real life, because of course, we don't expect it to be exactly the classical probability. We expect it to be close to the, the pro, um, classical probability. And the more you do it, the larger, or I mean, the closer it will be. There, and I wrote that up. In other words, the more we do the experiment of tossing the coin and the die, the closer our overall probability will be to that classical probability that we expect. Okay. Now, what does that mean for gambling? 
So if you've ever been to a casino, which you know can be fun, but never go in with more than you can afford to lose, right? So what are the implications? So in casinos, there are no there are no clocks and no windows because they want gamblers to stay as long as possible. Why? Well, because even if they're up for a little bit, right, so why? Even if the gamblers are up for a little bit, even if the gamblers, let me type this up one second. All right, this will do a better job of it. Casinos have no clocks and no windows. Casinos give out free drinks, alcoholic drinks at that, right? Both alcohol and otherwise. Oh. Casinos let you smoke. Casinos have ATMs, restaurants, shows, hotels, right? They have ways to keep you there, right? hotels and shows. Why? They want gamblers to stay as long as possible. So that way, even if a gambler is up for a little bit, right, to the good in the in the red or in the black, excuse me, then if they stay in the casino and they keep gambling. Eventually, they will lose because of the law of large numbers. This is what they mean when they say the house always wins. All casino games are stacked. Um, towards the house. They're given a classical probability edge to the house and it will bear fruit in the long run. So they just need to keep you there longer and keep you gambling and you will lose. Everybody does with the exception of rigging the game. So if you rig the game in some way, um, either legally or illegally. So there's the illegal ways to rig games, which, you know, watch an Ocean's Eleven movie or whatever. Um, or there's the legal ways, but frowned upon ways. For example, if you're a really good player, if you're capable of counting cards, if you're capable of reading other people's tells, if you're playing poker, those kinds of things. So those would be legal ways, but the casino doesn't have to serve you. So if they can figure out you're counting cards and they don't like it, they can kick you out. For example, um, Ben Affleck is actually an extremely good blackjack player, and he was barred from a casino in Las Vegas because he can count cards and he's too good. And so they stopped him from playing because the house was going to lose too much money if he stayed. There are various movies about the illegal ways to rig the game in your favor. I will let you watch one of those for fun. You can pretend that it's for a class. Um, the movie 21, not a very good movie, but it's talking about a real life situation where some MIT students um, figured out ways to break the house, essentially. Um, and also the um, Ocean's 10, 11, or it was 11, 12, and 13 movies, eh, they're fun. They're not very accurate necessarily in terms of the gambling, but they're fun. All right, I'll see you back here for the last couple pages in this section.